right, so I think, I think we can move on to talk about regulating Facebook. <laughs> um, so I, I mentioned that all four of us have, have essays on the topic of whether uh, social media platforms should be or can be constitutionally treated as uh, conduits rather than editors, publishers, speakers, uh, whatever, whatever the uh, uh, analogy uh, might be on the other side. Uh, I thought maybe, I know Eugene already has slides that go along with his essay. So I wanna invite Eugene to spend uh, a, a few minutes talking about his essay and then we can talk about how ours relate to it and, and hopefully get into an organic conversation pretty quickly. And for audience members, um, we will have re reserve some time for, for Q&A. So if at any point you have something you want to say or ask, please use your reaction uh, button to raise your hand and we will get to you uh, shortly. All right, Eugene. Thanks. Um, so um, I wanted to start my summary of my article uh, with a quote from Justice Stevens' dissent in Citizens United. Not, not so long ago, although it feels like a lifetime ago now with everything that's happened since. So remember, in Citizens United, the question was whether the law could, and in some measure should, uh, 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 bar corporations and unions from using their general treasury funds in order to advocate for or against candidates. The court, 5-4 five, five, majority, said that uh, it that law couldn't do that because that would be a First Amendment violation, uh, that corporations have the right to speak, including about candidates. Uh, Justice Stevens dissented uh, uh, for four justices. And my sense is that if you look kind of at elite opinion, especially let's say elite liberal opinion uh, following Citizens United, I think the dissent resonated much more with many people than, than the majority. Uh, so Justice Stevens's argument was that, look, uh, uh, it makes sense for a legislature to conclude that uh, uh, allowing this corporate speech gives corporations unfair influence in the electoral process and distorts public debate in ways that undermine the interests of listeners. Opinions of real people may be marginalized and that uh, uh, restricting this kind of speech for corporations is necessary, or at least could be viewed as necessary by the legislature to make sure that competition is truly competition among ideas and not just among who is the most funded. So this is a concern, a longstanding concern about uh, economic power being leveraged into political power. Uh, corporate domination of electioneering can also generate the impression that corporations dominate our democracy. And politicians who fear that a certain corporation can make or break their free election uh, chances may be cowed into silence about that corporation, although perhaps about other things that the corporation wants them to be silent about. So as it happens, I actually agree with the majority in Citizens United. I think this is a powerful argument by Justice Stevens, but not enough to justify restrictions on the corporation's ability to speak. Among other things, because I think it's a little bit, a little bit uh, overstated to be concerned about the dominating public debate. I mean, generally speaking, corporate expenditures aren't a huge chunk of, of uh, 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 political debate. Even following, uh, following Citizens United, my, as best we can tell, there may be five to 10% of all, of all ads uh, about politicians uh, come from corporations. Uh, uh, and I think it's just important that corporations be able to speak. I'm skeptical about arguments that entities speech interferes with others' speech. But I think Justice Stevens has a point when we're talking about corporate restrictions on individual speech and not just corporate corporations' ability to speak themselves, that there, it seems to me that if corporations, including social media platforms, get to pick and choose which ideas uh, can be spread or which factual assertions can be made, uh, well, it seems to me that that would risk distorting public debate and, and giving corporations undue influence, especially in a closely divided country where, uh, where corporations' ability to sway through these kinds of restrictions, even a few percent of the, of the vote could make a very big difference. So I think, again, Justice Stevens had a good point. Um, and uh, uh, maybe not, maybe on balance he was mistaken even as to corporate, uh, uh, even when applied to corporate restrictions. But again, I think, this is a serious argument that I think has to be confronted. Uh, so that my second thought about this is to think about the spectrum of platforms, including 
platforms we don't think of, we don't label platforms because they're pre the internet era, but still are in a sense platforms. So on one hand, newspapers and magazines, I think have indubitable and correctly have first amendment rights to decide what to include and what to exclude. Among other things, the reason we read certain newspapers and magazines is precisely because of what they exclude, at least as much as about what they include, right? Somebody wants to subscribe to National Review or New Republic, they're looking for, for a particular editorial judgment. Even with a newspaper that purports to be, to be balanced in its presentation or more factual, still you want a newspaper that excludes bunk, right? This is a very valuable thing that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, editors provide to us. Uh, bookstores, bookstores don't edit kind of on a line by line basis, but they too choose what to include. Uh, uh, at least uh, in traditional bookstores have often limited themselves. Well, there's a feminist bookstore, a free market bookstore, a Christian bookstore, uh, whatever else. Uh, and I think actually I, I was commissioned by Google to write a paper about this, but I'd also say this is my, wearing my academic hat. For example, when Google is provider of search, offers its search engine, that too is something that's, that should be seen as protected by the First Amendment as to its decisions to include as well as exclude, to downgrade as well as upgrade. And I think the same may be true about Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter recommending, say, pages you might like. But, but then we look at other features of Facebook. And then at the very bottom, we look at phone companies, UPS, FedEx. You know, phone companies can't cancel your phone line because they don't like what you're saying on it. And that's true even setting aside privacy concerns. Imagine there is a phone line that is publicly known to be, this is the line you call up in order to hear the KKK re recruiting pitch. Or this is the line that Antifa uses to spread its message. And we know this because it's got a website that says call this number. So it's all very much in the open. Or this is a line that's being used for get out of the vote by Republicans or Democrats or socialists or whatever group maybe the phone company doesn't like. Phone company doesn't get to cancel that line. Phone company is a common carrier. Uh, not as to all the things that it does, but at least as to phone lines, it's a, it is not entitled to discriminate uh, based on ideological viewpoint. Uh, Likewise with UPS and FedEx. They may dislike one of those bookstores up in the second bullet. They may think it's spreading evil ideas, uh, but they can't, uh, uh, they can't um, uh, refuse to deliver material because it comes from a socialist bookstore, let's say. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think that's a probably unbalanced a good idea. By the way, note, some phone companies are monopolies, or at least historically have been regulated monopolies, but this also applies to cellular companies, which are famously competitive with each other. I don't think that those companies should be able to use their economic power to influence political debate in those kinds of things. Maybe, maybe they should be. Maybe I should be more libertarian and say, you know, leave it all to the market. Uh, but I'm not sure about that. I think that probably our current status quo there is a pretty sensible one. And then one wonders, what about Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter when they're acting this kind of like like de delivery services, package, or instead of package delivery services, they're packet delivery services. Uh, to be sure, that may better describe certain things at lower level uh, of, uh, um, of the in uh, internet stack. But also, it's in a sense, that's what, let's say, YouTube does, is it provides people the opportunity to go and see videos that they know they want. Let's say they've subscribed to some, uh, some channel. Or Twitter, somebody wants to subscribe to someone's account. Uh, so if it's willing viewers who are trying to access this material there, I think there's a pretty good argument that they ought to be treated the same way as users of the phone company that want to call up some phone number and listen to what people at that phone number want to say. Uh, whereas again, as I said, if you're talking about these platforms recommending pages, I think that's a lot more like the editorial function uh, that's properly reserved or that's properly protected when it's newspapers, magazines, bookstores that do it. And likewise, there's a lot to be said for having them have the ability to manage conversations, uh, comments by outsiders and users' pages or tweets, at the very least to block spam, because otherwise it would be, uh, the system would be, would be unusable in many ways, but also perhaps for other things as well. So let me close by just saying that uh, uh, there is something very similar in the First Amendment case law. On one hand, when you have Miami Herald, well, excuse me, when you, when you have newspapers, Miami Herald v. Tornillo, the court says, oh, they can't be required to publish, say, replies to uh, material from candidates or to criticism of candidates because that's an interference with editorial judgment. Hurley says the same thing about parade organizers. 
On the other hand, when you're talking about a shopping mall uh, and that may want to exclude leaf litters and signature gatherers, the prune yard case says, if state law says that shopping malls must allow uh, a lot of speakers on their property, that's a, that's a constitutional mandate of, of, uh, of access. Uh, Turner Broadcasting said the same thing about must-carry rules, that cable systems may indeed constitutionally be required to carry broadcast channels, precisely because the cable system isn't seen by people as like one parade, let's go and watch what's on spectrum today. No, it's seen as a place where a whole bunch of individual, individual in the sense of, of not the phone, not the cable company, obviously their, their businesses, their corporations, but all sorts of individual speakers uh, speak in many respects, I think Twitter and the Twitter feeds is very much like cable system and cable channels. And finally, Rumsfeld, to be fair, university may be required to allow military recruiters on its property. Uh, universities had ideological reasons they wanted to exclude military recruiters. Well, court said it's permissible for the law to require them to do that. Um, and let me just close with one other quote, also from a dissent, although this is one that I think the majority would have agreed with. Uh, this is, uh, sorry, this is, I think, from Justice Breyer's uh, dissent in USAID VA OSI, one of those cases, requiring someone to host another person's speech is often a perfectly legitimate thing for the government to do. Not always, but often. And I think that at least as to um, uh, requirements of, uh, of equal access to the hosting function of social media platforms, um, uh, that kind of mandate would be constitutional. Okay, great. So uh, Cr Christopher, do you want to explain what your uh, essay does and, and maybe how it relates to, to Eugene's? Sure, I'd be delighted to. Uh, thank you again to for hosting uh, this event. I'm delighted and honored to be part of the inaugural issue of the Journal of Free Speech Law. Thank you to the three of you for uh, in initiating this. It's been very, it's been tremendously important. So, um, in in my uh, I t my taking off point really was uh, a concurrence by Justice Thomas, really calling for use of common carriage and public accommodations classifications as areas where we've allowed if you will, greater mandates of non-discrimination without perceivably uh, limiting uh, first Amendment, infringing people, the actor's First Amendment rights. And um, I'm happy to talk about that more on the definitional side about what constitutes a common carriage and what co common carrier and what constitutes a public accommodation. And there's historical aspects to that. Uh, I'll, I won't go into that at great length because uh, those things can be redefined or frankly, even if the categories aren't accepted, we can do new things. And I think Osh makes the point in his paper better than I do in mine. Uh, what does that all have to do with constitutional rights anyway? Which is the, the legislature can change the definitions of the categories, but the really fundamental questions from a free speech standpoint is, um, does that violate some constitutional provisions? And the fact that it, category changes have happened can't be dispositive of that. Um, what's interesting is um, uh, I, I find myself struck by uh, the fact that the two things that Eugene quoted at length were both dissents. And I think it's emblematic, reflective of a basic tension to go really meta here and even beyond my paper between two conceptions of free, uh, particularly the First Amendment. Uh, the traditional conception is looked at as a, as a negative liberty, a limit on government. And the other is to think of it more as an instrumental social welfare construct designed to create a good world, regardless of how that's defined. It can be the uh, marketplace of ideas and getting out truth. It can be better democracy. It can be better um, uh, commerce. I mean, any way you want to do it, an instrumental value towards something else. And we've been having this fight in the literature for a long time, at least 50 plus years, if not older. Uh, going back to Thomas Emerson and I'm showing 50, I'm getting old, I can't even do math anymore like this, but you know, going way back even much farther than that. And what I would say is by and large, my read of the doctrine without getting into the theory is by and large, we've stuck pretty closely to the negative liberty conception. We've uh, held on to the state's uh, action doctrine. And, you know, we see, you know, even things like the, the crush porn cases, U.S. versus Stevens, you know, a bunch of really repugnant things that really can't be explained and we're protecting it because it's good for society. And it's more about a liberty oriented vision. And it really is encapsulated to me by a concurrence that Justice Douglas wrote in CBS versus DNC. It said, the First Amendment just tells us who the editor can't be and that's the government. 
And he said, it's not that private censorship, if you will, although technically under the negative conception, that's a contradiction in terms, but that private actors do exercise that kind of control is reality, but using the government to cure it would be a cure that's worse than the disease itself. And that is embedded in this certain conception and how we're gonna allow uh, governments to step in to cure what we perceive to be defects in speech markets uh, and overcome individual choices to do that. And so um, to, to try to make this more of a conversation as Jane has suggested, I think that very much is laying at the bottom of this. So what we see in the cases that uh, Eugene has put on the table and I do in mine on common carriage and uh, the public accommodations cases like Hurley and Dale and Fair versus Rumsfeld is they sort of distill themselves down to, to two basic principles, which is if the conduct at issue is inherently expressive, it's protected. And this is the distinction that Fair versus Rumsfeld made is, hey, hosting people to, to uh, conduct interviews on campus is not inherently expressive in the same way that the parade was in Hurley or the membership of homosexual leaders in Dale and the, uh, they're interfering with their ability to espouse certain values. And the second really is about whether viewers are likely to view the carriage as an endorsement of the message that's being carried. And that's a pretty typical distillation of the cases that you see in the Supreme Court doctrine. And what you have to ask yourself in this case is if we're talking directly about social media platforms and other digital platforms, um, it's, it does seem like inherently expressive conduct. I mean, you're carrying speech proper, not an interview of, of potential recruiters or some of these more indirect things. And that what's really quite interesting to me is um, there's a bunch of cases I talk about, but the one that I, I think is flying under the radar that I really enjoy, uh, the network neutrality case in the DC circuit has an interesting dialogue between the panel majority and just judge, then Judge Kavanaugh. And the panel majority said basically, hey, the, um, the First Amendment's not in play because it's only, the only conduct that's implicated by the regulation is speech over which the ISP does not pretend to exercise any editorial control. So, so to that extent, we're not really talking about anything here important from a free speech standpoint. Now, the negative implication of that is if they're going to use that as their means to avoid the First Amendment stuff is to the extent to which they choose to exercise that, they might be in the soup. And in fact, that's exactly what they said in response to Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh said, hey, if you do this, Google, Facebook are going to be regulable without respect to the First Amendment. And the panel majority in their concurrence to the denial of a hearing on Bonk said, no, 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 no. They're not implicated here because we're only talking about rules that apply to people who don't exercise any, any discretion. Now, if we take that seriously as their ability to evade that argument, what we're seeing here is a recognition that implicitly that panel said, hey, Facebook and Google do exercise discretion and therefore they have First Amendment protection. And so it's an interesting set of arguments about how we have to think about this. Um, it's, uh, I will say close with two things that I find interesting about uh, Eugene's proposals. One, it's interesting that recommendations get more protection than the actual speech being carried, uh, which seems counterintuitive to me. And I will say I do read Turner very differently than he did. I, under its terms, it really emphasized fundamental technological differences that uh, about that constituted physical bottlenecks that turned certain actors into gatekeepers. And they said it's not about market dysfunction, it's not about economic characteristics, monopoly power, or other things. It has to be a physical connection. And in that sense, when we think about the platforms that were really that are in the news these days, they don't really have a physical connection that puts them in that position. And so the, what's striking is when we think about Turner and we think about the other frameworks, um, do, is this core speech activity they're required to, core, to carry or is it something not really inherently expressive? I think it's hard to say that what is being carried by hosted by these places isn't inherently expressive. And I would say right now, um, based on the criticism these, actor, these platforms are getting for their decisions to carry, the idea that they're endorsing or having that uh, responsibility attributed to them, I think probably is stronger now than ever. And possibly, interestingly, maybe socially contingent based on the facts, which in case we'll have a First Amendment that moves, which may be one of the reasons to take the more negative conception of free speech to begin with. Before I ask 
ask to comment um, on that last point. If if the public for some reason suddenly started criticizing cell phone service providers for uh, for enabling the sorts of conversations that do happen uh, on over the telephone, would that then give cell phone service providers a greater you know greater access to First Amendment protection on that basis? Under the two part synthesis um, I'm offering is is first is is the decision to carry inherently expressive in the way the inclusion in a parade and Hurley would have been. So it might and not meet that. It might not. And so, for example, uh, there are some that do. You know, I think um, Eugene even mentioned some. You know, uh, net friend, you know, child friendly internet provision or child internet friendly websites. Or right. we'll talk about halal websites or Christian websites or Christian providers of social media of all kinds. Uh, you can start to see a range of possibilities where people start creating a curated experience. And you know, many times we use the, uh, in the discourse, curated is used as a negative. Um, curation actually is one inevitable because especially in a world of user generated content, we're all drowning in the fire hose. We need someone to help us sort this stuff out. And second is uh, recognized in the old First Amendment cases as a value, a First Amendment pro free speech value for the reasons Eugene said earlier, we wouldn't want a common carrier where we take whatever quality comes down the pipe and in terms of irrelevance or relevance or frankly offensiveness, in fact, we do need and prefer having worlds in which there is intermediation. I don't wake up every morning and crawl the entire internet to see what's new. I rely on some intermediary where it's an email exploder or a, a media venue or a, even a search engine to do to guided searches on my own to find content in ways that I'm interested in. And or increasingly social media is, is becoming much more important ways of finding information. And we see this world in which, you know, we see, it's not the case that we have this unintermediate experiences and very much dependent on these actors. And in a world where they, as I think Eugene said properly, they adopt different editorial policies, different approaches, and some are more successful, some are less. Uh, those actually promote free speech values in important ways that, it, uh, that many of the solutions people are proposing would interfere with uh, in ways I think are problematic. All right, Ash. Uh oh, Ash. Muted. <laughs> of course, <laughs> you'd think I'd be used to Zoom by now. Um, thank you for that. Um, I want to start off just by saying the fact that today I get to describe myself as more libertarian than Eugene Volokh is an apothesis in my life. So um, I'm, I'm, I'm enjoying this moment thoroughly. Um, that was, it, it turns out that Christopher and I we're looking at the same problem and reach almost the same, I think basically the same place, but we started at opposite ends. Um, he started off with the common carrier issue and I started off thinking about the first amendment, obviously mixing both up. And yes, the Thomas opinion in the Biden versus Knight Foundation, uh, Knight Institute case was, was a driver for me as well. I start off with the notion that I don't think anyone here would disagree with that presumptively people have editorial, that platforms have editorial rights. And we have not digital platforms, non-digital platforms, newspapers, with a cutout for some entities that we call common carriers or places of public accommodation that don't, but they're the exception, not the rule. Um, and, I, and I actually think it's important to describe the right as an editorial right or a right of curation as Christopher did rather than a speech right because I think it's really, it provides clarity because it's not really a speech right, right? I mean, Facebook generally is speaking very little. It's warning label speak, but it's, most Facebook speech and Twitter speech is not its own speech. I also don't think the compelled speech doctrine is a good fit here because People don't attribute posts on social media to the platform. But it is a right to provide a curated experience. Um, and I think that that right has always been understood to be implicit in, if not the speech clause, the press clause of the First Amendment. Um, one of the realities is that as we have all become publishers, the this always hazy distinction between speech and press has collapsed. Um, in a digital world, they're one thing. But that's important because I think lessons from the press clause can tell us a lot about what we call speech today. It's famously the Supreme Court doesn't use the press clause for anything, but I think there are lessons to be learned from its history. Um, and I think that if you look at the development of technology, digital um, sort of electronic technology and then digital technology, starting with broadcast, 
what we see is, is, is that in the early years, the Supreme Court was uncomfortable. Newspaper, I mean, this is a stunning fact. Movies did not receive First Amendment protection until 1952, which is crazy, right? I mean, that's crazy. It's a sign that the justice is being completely out of touch with reality. I consider that their treatment of similarly out of touch, the fairness doctrine, red lion, it's past history, it doesn't matter. I think that moving forward, the justices have been much clearer that presumptively new technologies receive First Amendment rights. Turner and Cable was a slight exception, but like Christopher, I read Turner very differently because I think it really is about a unique feature of cable television in the 1990s and late 80s, which was it was a physical bottleneck. And I would add that if Turner was before the court today, it should come out opposite because the bottleneck no longer exists. No one relies on the cable network for anything anymore in the world of the internet and streaming and mobile ISPs and so forth. Um, and so I think that what we, sh we should move forward with is this presumption that, yeah, if you're providing, if you're providing a platform for other people's speech and you are not the government, not the post office, you presumptively have a right to control what experience you provide. Um, and I think that that reasoning applies naturally to social media platforms because they do provide a curated experience. I mean, the idea, I mean, if you look at the criticisms of them, the criticisms from the right are all about too much curation. But to argue that people who are curating too much are common carriers is to my mind nutty. It doesn't make any sense um, because common carriers definitionally don't cure it. And the curation is not a new thing. We are, you know, the curation issues have gotten caught up in culture wars in the last few years, especially the last couple of years. Um, but even in 2016, Donald Trump wouldn't be president without Twitter, right? I mean, it's important to remember that social media, in fact, allowed the rise of President Trump. And it was liberals who were criticizing social media for providing him platform where he evaded institutional gatekeepers. I personally think that's a silly criticism. I think the idea that institutional gatekeepers are inherently a good thing is very odd in a democratic society. Um, and so the question becomes, you know, do we treat Facebook as a common carrier or someone who has an obligation to host? And I don't see it. Um, Facebook has always been a curated experience. If you look at the fights over curation, they go back to the early days of Facebook. I mean, there was, you know, Facebook has from the beginning had a um, ban on nudity. And um, there were fights when Facebook was a small company located in downtown Palo Alto. I remember standing across from its headquarters and their ban on nudity, its application to breastfeeding blew up. There was a protest across the street from them in 2012, something very early. And Facebook went through this incredibly long struggle to define nudity in this particular context. Those were choices, those were value choices. And frankly, they were viewpoint choices in many ways, like the ban on um, hate speech, which has always been there, the ban on glorification of violence. All of these are curation choices that are very conscious. Finally, well, I agree with Christopher that monopoly status is not really determinative of common carrier status either way. Some common carriers are not monopolies, not all monopolies are common carriers, see Tornillo and the Miami Herald. Um, Facebook is not a monopoly. Um, it doesn't have any physical control over access to users. It has a large percentage of um, the market, 70% is the most recent I saw, and that's a very fragile thing. Switching costs are zero in this world, um, and there's no, there's no reason why Facebook is going to keep it. Plus, we know from recent leaks that Facebook is worried as heck that it's not reaching younger audiences. So that in a generation, I mean, Facebook could easily go the way of, what was that first one, my something? Um, I don't even remember what that platform was. Um, but it's, it, it easily could go. And especially if- we, Well, Friendster. Friendster, yeah. Friendster I just, predated MySpace. MySpace, there it is. I mean, all of these yeah. platforms that have just vanished. I mean, especially if we force Facebook to spin off Instagram, which I have no problem with. Antitrust law applies to platforms just like anyone else. I just, I don't think there's a big problem here. I think that migration to Parler after the great deplatforming demonstrates that. And finally, I'm gonna close with a question for Eugene, which after you, Jane gets a chance to speak, I'd like him to think about. I don't really, the distinction that he has drawn between hosting 
on the one hand and recommending on the other. I don't understand it. And maybe it's because the only social media platform I really engage with is Facebook. Um, I, like, I think I have a Twitter account, but I'm not sure I've ever opened it, I'm unusual. Um, I don't understand what hosting means because if it's not gonna be recommended, if it's not gonna be visible on your feed, if the material is available, someone would have to search for it. But if they know it's available and they have to search for it, they could find it in a billion other places, right? I mean, Donald Trump, if he wants to speak, he can just, he, he could post stuff anywhere and his followers can find it. It's not hard to find Trump's statements. Um, so I, I'm, I would be curious for Eugene to explain what exactly the value is of hosting. I still think, by the way, it's unconstitutional to be clear, but I would be curious <laughs> about what the value is of a hosting requirement abs if, if it's, basically buried. And I will stop there. Yeah, and I too was going to raise the possibility that even though the three of our essays uh, conclude something different with respect to the hosting uh, function, I'm not sure it matters much in terms of the real world, uh, real world effects. So if Eugene agrees that there is strong First Amendment protection for the curation decisions that are inherent to recommend re recommendations like the uh, news feed or um, or YouTube's homepage, uh, then uh, that would that would be a big disappointment, I think, to a lot of uh, conservatives who are trying to regulate in this area. But I do want to pick up. I'll, I'll I'll give Eugene the floor in a second, but I want to pick up sort of more or less where Ash uh, ended with his comments about. Facebook not being a monopoly. My uh, essay, which by the way, I co-authored with two tech law students here at the University of Arizona, James Rollins and, and Vinny Yesway. So thank you uh, to, to them. Um, we ultimately conclude that the thread between the Supreme Court precedents suggests that, that domination in some form does matter. So, so even with the Turner case, the physical bottleneck that, that Ash and, and Christopher alluded to was uh, knowing that people generally being people and being lazy in specific foreseeable ways won't actually change where their uh, cord is. And so it got me thinking about what types of, what, what I think the court's really looking for are um, venues that have a sufficient level of stickiness so that we need to be worried about um, speakers not being able to access listeners or um, maybe even more core to my sort of orientation of the First Amendment, listeners not being able to uh, access speech. Um, and so uh, I don't, I agree with Ash that Facebook does not have much lock-in power. And by the way, this is quite controversial. I think Ash would agree that, that many people talking about Facebook uh, as a social media platform, not as a not in terms of its buying up uh, Instagram and whatnot. Um, I, I think many people assume that it is uh, dominant and wields its dominance. I see it as a scared company, and even even Google looks the same to me. They um, they uh, are following the user trends, not creating them. Um, and so it's, they're very responsive to users, which means they're very responsive to listeners. And for that reason, the editorial choices that they make being a rough reflection of what they, their best guess of what listeners actually wanna see, uh, it should be protected for the same reasons that listeners' rights are protected in the first place. Um, the other thought that I've had since um, writing the essay and thinking about it a little bit, uh, and, and this might relate to the question about the importance of the algorithms that make recommendations, is it, it's possible that, so when Parler got its big uh, thrust after the great deplatforming in January, um, it's true that it, it attracted something like 15 million users almost instantly. And that showed that, um, that there is not lock-in in Facebook. But on the other hand, 15 million is not as m large of an audience as, as Trump had on Twitter, right? So one question is uh, whether, um, whether we need to worry that, that users, even though they can join multiple platforms at multiple times and have access to, to speech uh, without, you know, they can, they can, you know, being, joining Twitter does not preclude uh, engaging fully with Facebook. Even though all of that is true, is there some stickiness that, that people like Ash and I aren't taking fully into account? I think it might be that, in, that there is not much stickiness and that what we're actually seeing is that some people wind up having, win some speakers 
get these temporary windfalls where the algorithm at some at time zero <laughs> manages to stream, you know, manages to, to funnel a large audience to them. So they temporarily at least have have have, have quite a lot of uh, visibility. And if the algorithm changes and the followers don't bother to go find them anyways, if the followers don't bother to find them on Substack, if they've been, you know, if, if they've become disillusioned with um, Twitter or something like that, um, it means something important. It, mean, it means that it might be that the original era, T0, when the speaker was getting an undue amount of audience, rather than T1, when the speaker lost the audience. Uh, so if, if, if I guess this raises a sort of question where I, I think it's hard to draw lines here, but if what we're really talking about is users behaviorally just deciding not to bother putting in the effort to go find the speakers that they're interested in, what does that mean in terms of free speech um, theory? Uh, so Eugene, you can comment and, and respond to any or all of that, and then I hope we can kind of have a more loose conversation and, and open up to questions soon. Sure. Um, so it's all very interesting. I'm just delighted by uh, uh, people participating in the, uh, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, in both this conversation and uh, in the issue and engaging with some of the things that, that I've said as I've tried to engage with, with others. I think this is at the very least, it's a really important conversation to be having. Maybe it'll turn out I'm wrong and I'll be happy to be persuaded otherwise. Um, well, what I wanted to do is I wanted to turn a little bit of this curation point and also deal with the questions people ask like, what is this hosting function and how is it different from a recommendation function? Let's look at an institution whose very job is curation, the university. The university engages in a vast amount of speech, both of its own and curating other speech, right? One criterion that people choose in deciding whether to go to university as students is, do they, have they selected really good faculty? Have they come up with a really useful and interesting curriculum? And obviously the university has to have very broad authority to make those choices. To be sure, because of academic freedom traditions, faculty members get a shocking amount of latitude once they're hired in designing their classes and the like, but still, um, uh, it's uh, it's not something that, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, still, even if it's faculty as well as the university curating together, they all do this curation. Likewise, there are lecture series that are heavily curated. Uh, there are uh, uh, there are symposia where one choice is to, uh, one way, way does we decide whether we go to a symposium is, is the university likely to have invited really good people on the subject? Hugely curated. And then the university says, we also want to curate, as we've long had the power to, who gets to recruit on campus. Recruiting, after all, on campus is speech. The court did not deny that for a moment in Rumsfeld because it couldn't be denied. That's all recruiting is in those, that kind of context. It's speaking about, uh, it's listening to the student's speech as well, but it's also speaking out about the options that, uh, uh, that you have in order to try to persuade uh, uh, people to come work for you. Uh, so uh, the university wanted to curate that in order to, to contribute to what it thought was a, a, a kind of a proper environment of non-discrimination. This was a time, of course, when, uh, when the military was discriminating based on sexual orientation through the don't ask, don't tell policy. Uh, speaking of public criticism of universities, there were certainly lots of groups that were trying to pressure universities into excluding military recruiters. And the universities stressed in their litigation that look, because you're requiring us to include them, we're getting all this pushback and we have to spend all this time explaining it's not really our fault. And the court unanimously said the university could be required to allow um, uh, uh, um, uh, recruiters on campus. Now, the particular law there actually uh, merely mandated universities to do that as a condition of funding. But the Supreme Court made it quite explicit that even if Congress said, it, just as a general matter, all universities must allow military recruiters, that would be uh, constitutionally permissible. By the way, shopping centers are huge curators too, right? They pick and choose what stores to have. They pick and choose what music to play, what bands to invite and what other things, what other events to put on. Uh, and when they said we also want to kind of curate speech by our visitors by saying no, no, uh, uh, no leafletting, or in later versions, no display of images of uh, aborted fetuses, or no picketing of our own stores, 
the the California court said, nope, under California law, you're not entitled to do this curation. And the Supreme Court said, well, you don't have a First Amendment right to do this curation. This also relates, I think, to this distinction between the hosting function and the recommendation function. If the university were, excuse me, if, they, uh, if uh, uh, the government were to say to universities, you know, you have to announce events as kind of recommended to the public, just announce events generally, without regard to ideology. That is to say, uh, you have to promote in your speaker series speeches, let's say, next door to the university, even ones you think are by fools. That would be a clear violation of the university's own rights to choose what to recommend. On the other hand, if uh, 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 the, uh, the um, mandate is simply you have to host military recruiters, or in principle, it could be people other than military recruiters as well, uh, that's permissible. Likewise, by the way, some a few states apply these shopping mall rules we're talking about, which only a few states have, but some do, to, to, to universities as well. I believe it's Pennsylvania and New Jersey uh, that people have a right to speak in university campuses. It doesn't mean the university has to praise them or recommend them, but it does have to provide hosting for them on the same terms, at least if they're just speaking uh, out in a public quad, as it does to others. And then that also brings, I think, uh, uh, Ash's excellent, excellent question of, well, if they, if university, or excuse me, if Facebook has, a, has the power to choose what to recommend and whatnot, what if it just says, okay, we refuse to show up any of your, po show any of your posts in, in the news feeds, even to people who, uh, who are following you, who are friends of yours, uh, wouldn't that effectively be the same as saying we can't, we won't host you? Well, one interesting feature, perhaps the, more, the most questionable feature, but still one that garnered unanimous support of Rumsfeld is that the court said, together with this duty to host recruiters, you also have to provide, on an even-handed basis, you have to provide basically kind of information about them as well. That you can't just say, okay, fine, you can be, you can be on campus recruiting, but we won't tell anybody what room you're in. We won't announce that you're, that you're present. When we have a list of all of, the, uh, of all of the recruiters, we'll exclude you. The court said, no, no. Under the law, you can indeed be required to include the recruiters on an even-handed basis. Again, you don't have to praise them. In fact, you're perfectly free to condemn them at the same time that you're including them. But you have to include them on an even-handed basis. Now, the scope of this speech incident to conduct exception, which is a hugely complicated and perhaps misguided ultimately, but very well established uh, exception, is not completely clear. But I do think that if there is this duty to host, there may also be a duty to say, uh, 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 on the platform's part, a duty to um, uh, provide kind of comparable access and comparable information about, about pages that people have already said, yes, I want to go and see, because this is a friend of mine, or this is a Twitter account that I'm following or something like that. Uh, so I think that that would be so. Um, so, and, uh, uh, if, if I'm, uh, I may well be wrong about this, and maybe the court was wrong in Rumsfeld as well. My friend and co-blogger Dale Carpenter, I believe, wrote an article about Rumsfeld the Fair called Unanimously Wrong. Uh, it's certainly possible, but I think given Rumsfeld and Prunier and Turner put together, there's a lot of authority for the proposition that uh, the government can require uh, entities to host even speech they disapprove of. Uh, and to provide kind of equal access to that speech for people who want to see it. I want to Is that equal access? I'm sorry, Ash. I want to respond to that very briefly. I, I, yeah. I agree with you that if the analogy between Rumsfeld and social media held, your point would hold. I just think that setting up interviewing at law schools is just not one of the curation functions of the university. I think that obviously universities are very complex institutions. Of course, the courses they offer are curated. Of course, symposia they sponsor are curated. But I just don't see recruiting as, as, as to quote you, a coherent speech vehicle. Um, and I think, but I actually have a question for Christopher because this, this question of where you have control over access, the way I read your paper, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that basically once a platform chooses to exercise editorial discretion, under historical practice, they fall out of the common carrier category. So could it be that if tomorrow Verizon announced we are no longer providing phone service to entities connected with ex-political cause, 
that all of a sudden they gain First Amendment rights? Um, it, it, or is that, or is it that historically, because telephone has been treated as a common carrier for a hundred years, it's a different matter. I'm curious what your response is. So the quick response is to, I wanted to complexify your question in two ways. If it's they good. chose to add a curated editorial content service on top of their existing service, the cable telco cross ownership cases say they have a first amendment right to do so. The second question is, is there a barrier to preventing them from then exiting the common carriage services at the same time? And there you get into duty of serve. Uh, you know, it, one of the things about common carriage, you have to have entry restrictions. You have to get a certificate of public interest, necessity, and convenience to go in. You also have exit restrictions, which are largely driven by something else. So the question is, are you compelled to continue to act in a certain capacity? And right now, the answer possibly is yes. And this is going to get at, interestingly, in the network neutrality debate, they're worried that the addition of editorial control services, that is this what we call specialized services, or there's other terms that are even worse, but like non-biased services, which are really a terrible name, but they can add those on top as long as they can maintain a certain amount of basic, if you will, common carriage services. And there's an underlying question which you're raising, which is, if I didn't want to do this anymore, there's clearly a legal barrier, which is the common carriage exit requirement. Is there, does the First Amendment play into that where I can be forced to continue to use my capacity for non-discriminatory services when I want to devote them to curated services? Uh, that is a question about which there's very, very little law. And um, I would think that um, the pragmatics would probably take over, but there's an argument based on the ones, you're not misreading my case you may have a First Amendment right to withdraw from doing common carriage services if you think, I think that's not a good business for me anymore and my speech interests are suggesting that I should do it. Um, if I wanted to do, if you will, a, a Christian right ISP, an internet service, could I be allowed to drop my non-discriminatory service and do that? There's an argument, the answer is yes. So I, I have a question, I guess, for the group. Um, one thing I find, uh, one reason I'm sympathetic to, to Eugene's position and, and also um, that of, uh, of, of the Thomas uh, concurrence um, uh, is that I, I worry very much that, that what's driving, especially the demand that Facebook engage in more moderation is not a user who thinks I saw a post that has deeply disturbed me and rattled me, they need to do a better job, but rather person A saw a post that person B posted and now they both believe something bad. I want Facebook to go interfere with their communication. To the extent that that's what's driving a lot of the animus here, I, I, I am just, just disturbed by that kind of you know, pressure, both political and, and public, uh, on, on big social media companies like, like Facebook. But it seems to me that there still might be a solution other than government mandates of uh, carriage or something. And, and that's to foster um, greater access to self-imposed moderation, like moderation tools. So, so that, I guess it takes, the, it takes the power out of complaints about moderation. If I have many more controls than I currently do to modify my, the algorithm that, <laughs> that uh, generates content for me and recommends content for me. Um, and then at least it exposes that what people are really arguing about is, is legal speech that they think is harmful and, 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 and we can have the debate on those terms. Uh, what do you all think? Oh, I have a question actually. Okay. We, talk, we, we are all caught in this political space, right? But let's, let's talk about pornography um, because you know, pornography that is that under, I believe Eugene's theory because most pornography is perfectly protected, constitutionally protected. I think Facebook could be forced to post pornography Right. I mean, I don't see any way out of that because I think that a ban on pornography is is certainly content based and probably viewpoint based, based on views about nudity and about sexuality. I but I can imagine Facebook really not wanting to do that, like really not wanting to do that, to be associated with that speech. How and I think this is I think Christopher and I agree they shouldn't be forced to do that. But do you guys think they should be? Well. Uh 
It's, it's, it's a great question. I've had I've thought some about it. Uh, and um, I, I think the answer, so first of all, content-based uh, uh, restrictions might be treated differently from viewpoint-based ones. Uh, and in fact, uh, the law, rightly or wrongly, has treated restrictions on pornography as content, but based but viewpoint neutral. That, that's the line, that's the line that, that courts generally draw, which also helps explain why historically the FCC has been allowed to ban nudity online, even though the court in the Pacifica case uh, made clear that, that viewpoint-based distinctions would be impermissible. The second thing is, if I'm wrong, and if it turns out that Facebook is required to host pornography, which is to say, hosted for those people who who post it and those people who come to watch it, not necessarily to distribute it to unwilling viewers. I'm not sure the skies would fall. And one piece of evidence is Twitter hosts pornography. And you know, you can go to some of these uh, uh, Twitter feeds and you can see it. And I've ne I don't recall ever having been involuntarily confronted with it somehow through Twitter by its algorithms finding it uh, for me. I don't think it'd be the end of the world. And likewise, if UPS or FedEx were to say, oh, it's horrible, we have to deliver these packages, which we are almost certain have, have dirty pictures and videos. Not that anybody sends that by package anymore, but used to. The answer is, well, you know, maybe we could have a rule that says uh, you can exclude pornography again because it's viewpoint neutral. Uh, uh, even though content-based, but if we, but if it turns out for whatever reason, we can either require you to carry everything or give you unlimited discretion to say we don't want to include uh, 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 socialists or libertarians or whatever else. So their speech, I think the answer is not the end of the world. Uh, if Facebook has to be in the position of Twitter, where people who want to distribute pornography on it to other people who want to view it will be able to do that, you know, I think. I think the skies will not fall. Well, no, but, but Twitter has chosen to be an anything goes platform, right? I mean, they've backed off of it recently, but Jack Dorsey used to be the, the you know, right. internet libertarian guy. I feel like that actually is, it accentuates Jane's point, which I agree with, which is, is that platforms are in fact distinguishing themselves. Facebook but, wants to be more, for want of a better word, family friendly. Right, but you know, Twitter. you know, this is what Pruneyard also said. We want to be a mall where people aren't confronted with political speech that they, uh, that they dislike. Uh, and so as a result, we're just gonna have a rule, no leafleting, no nothing. You can come and talk to friends, but you can't go out there and try to talk to strangers. The, the US Supreme Court said, if California wants to say that, uh, that Bruneyard has to host these things, it's got to host them, and too bad if the result is that, that the company is upset or even some visitors are upset. Likewise, and this may be cut in favor of that maybe the requirement would be uh, content neutrality and not just viewpoint neutrality, um, California courts have indeed said that, that, a, that a shopping mall can't even exclude uh, abor anti-abortion protests with pictures, graphic pictures of aborted penises. Now, maybe that California courts went too far in that kind of situation, but I don't think that they violated the First Amendment rights uh, of the shopping mall to categorically exclude speech that they dislike, even though that speech would have been uh, viewable by unwilling viewers. So as a policy matter, uh, Ash, maybe you're right. And maybe as a policy matter, we should be much more respectful of private property rights in all these situations, maybe even for UPS and maybe even for phone companies. Although, again, I'm not sure about that, but maybe you're right. But as a First Amendment matter, I don't think that, uh, uh, that there is a categorical First Amendment right not to host pornography. So I, I've teased you with this before, Eugene, when we talked about this before, you know, to me, Pruneyard seems to be the case everyone cites in, a, that in an argument that gets rejected. It's not the most robust, and, and we have to go back through all the cases, how we distinguished it and limit it in different ways. And but then there's Ralph uh, de Vare, which, uh, uh, which uh, takes a, a very much the same approach, and I believe cites Pruneyard in the process, although not extensively. Yeah, but, and, but again, it's a, in this qualified world where we get to get into that world. But I don't think it's, I don't read it as broadly as you do. We'll set it. But I want to make a, a much more fundamental question, which is, um, one of the things that strikes me about the stickiness that Jane's talking about and these practical questions about the import and would this be so terrible is it really does invite this sort of instrumental question about what the effect is going to be. And I try to envision what these hearings would be like to evaluate First Amendment claims. I would try to imagine what precedent would look like in this world. 
And the, the sort of orthodox negative liberty person said, let's not even play that game. Uh, the most terrifying thing to me is this is all based on this old, if you will, Brandeisian idea that the best cure to speech, bad speech is, not, is more speech, not restriction. Uh, there's a, a wonderful study by Linda Hall Jameson at the Edinburgh Public Policy Center who said that, you know, actually the best cure to fake news is not the truth. The best cure is equally biased news in the opposite direction as a counteractive. Now, I don't know empirically whether that's true or not, you know, I didn't study, but that possibility is, if you will, the libertarian's nightmare, which is if it's not true that the truth wins out in the marketplace of ideas, um, then it does invite that kind of balancing, but then it becomes basically a remedial question about do you really trust those people and do we have actual metrics to know, even if they were, believe we're doing the right thing and now's the time, how to implement it in a proper way. And it requires you to develop a lot of that apparatus, which is under good times difficult and under bad times terrifying. And so um, it, it could be a, a, a very second bestie way to get to the same point as opposed to the first principles, but it's one that I'm actually quite sympathetic to. Okay, well, our hour is uh, long past, well, three minutes past. <laughs> so uh, we can end it here. I'm sure that we all have more to say, but, um, but we'll get the chance. Uh, Christopher, I hope you're able to, to join us on, in some of the future sessions and, and contribute. Um, 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 our next one, actually, I should have this handy, but I don't, of course, let me see. Oh, our next sessions are November 8th. We have two on that day. Um, I will be talking to Alan Rosenstein at 11 a.m. Pacific, 12 o'clock Arizona time that day. And then right after that at 12 o'clock Pacific and one o'clock Arizona time, um, Ash will be running a conversation with Eric Goldman and Jess Myers. So um, I'll post in the chat here, the uh, website where you can get all this information. Hope to see you at future events and thanks very much for joining us. Mm -hmm.